Yeah. Welcome back. Welcome in. This is Country Roads Confidential at Earsports.com, a Paramount podcast. Back for the second time this week with Chris Anderson. This time we'll talk about, well, not basketball, not staffing, not roster, even though the urge is to dig in there. We're going to look elsewhere here, Chris. Other things happening on campus, other sports, other topics. Good news, dare I say. So why don't we dig into that and uh, make sure we sweep up what we could not get to. When we spoke on Monday here, I don't have any elaborate introductions here. No major coaching changes in college football to set the table here like on Monday in basketball. So it's okay with you. Reach right in. Grab us a question. What do you think? Let's go. Let's get started with the most talked about non-basketball topic of the message board for the last few weeks from Air Force 88 is the great band practice field scandal of 2024 now over. No. Now we have to do the postmortem, right? How did it happen? Yeah. Why did we overlook this valuable piece of real estate that was right on campus and right in a logistical sweet spot how do we not look at this before and then maybe like why was this so covert confidential um seemed a little bit devious if you ask me credit to the reporting here i don't think this gets a light of day unless somebody actually goes deep into the details the research the public records request um you know sometimes we kind of get disappointed or discouraged that you think the media can be tuned out and doesn't have the reach of the influence that it has before Sometimes you get redeeming stories like this where I think everybody who wasn't spited here, um, everybody gets that makes like the most sense here. It's the best outcome for everybody, for people who are donating in kind and to people who are involved in a short trip to a reasonable practice facility, as opposed to some like really convoluted, congested stretch of traffic way far from campus. So this seems like a good, a good resolution. I'd like to know how it got to this place in the first situation. Yeah, for those unfamiliar, which again, very popular on the board. So I'm assuming most people know what was going on, but the uh, ride of West Virginia's practice facility, practice field, new practice field that they had raised money for was supposed to be next to the Coliseum, correct? At the old baseball field. And they raised money for it with the expressed, um, express, expressed. Um, use of putting it there and instead didn't raise enough money. That's, that's part of it. That, that's the wrinkle I think here of, Hey, they were supposed to raise 5 million. It's been a couple of years. They only raised, what was it? One and a half. Um, and so other plans were made, but the problem is other plans were made in, as you put it, devious ways behind closed doors ways. And this field ended up being all the way over at Milan park. And that's just not, Really possible for, I think, a lot of those students, a lot of members of the band. Then after the reporting comes out, everyone's getting shamed. Everyone's getting outed. Oh, hey, look, Mike, this field right here next to the hospital, right near the football stadium that's been here the entire time, completely unused, is suddenly available, suddenly very available and very fitting for what we're trying to do. Um not a good look for those involved. Uh, you know, again, with the reporting, everything that came down was them threatening students, trying to silence them, all this other stuff. It's just not a very good look for something that seems not, excuse, I'm going to say small potatoes here, and I'm not talking about the band or their facility. I'm talking about the money involved here. You know, they're talking a couple million, like in a, in the grand scheme of things with these universities and, and, and counties and governments. And that's, close to pocket change. And and I can't believe that they would do this and they would do it so brazenly. I mean, you look at some of those emails and they are flat out saying in the emails that are foiled and, and were reported, they're just flat out saying it, that they're doing it clandestinely, that they're doing things they're not supposed to, that they're setting this up and just not a lot, not a good look for a lot of people involved there. Yeah. You wonder why they're so stingy about FOIA requests. Huh? Oh God, I can't send you down that path. Not I mean, I don't wonder. I don't wonder. No one else should either. But like, <laughs> there's a reason there too. Um, part of this thing is I understand the athletic department saying, "Man, this is valuable real estate. You guys have been sitting on it for a while. We can we can break ground tomorrow. You know, they can get funding like that. And for projects that they want to get going as part of their master plan, their facilities vision there. Um, and to have the clock ticking for so long, I can see there being an urgency and a frustration from the university. I don't think that you 
you renege on a promise. And I don't think that you um, just completely, I'm not saying the athletic department did this, but like kind of sneakily shovel the deck again. That That's strange to me. And then I know, by the way, you end up redirecting the funding so another facility can actually have use of the field you're putting in. Well, couldn't they raise money? Like, what's the deal there? So, like, it was, it was all, it's a really, really deep and interesting dive in the kind of bureaucratic stuff. And then, really, what happens when, you know, sometimes there's too many doors open and too many people can slip through. Um, and I will tell you how hot button this is, Chris. I tweeted about it one time and got a lot of like feedback and traffic on it. But somebody from the university was like, What are you doing? And I was like, Take a hike. What am I doing? <laughs> All I did was tweet about it. I didn't write. I didn't do the research. I didn't file the request. I didn't grant the requests. I didn't non-redact things. I'm not the bad guy here, too. So, like, it's funny sometimes where, like, just people don't want light turned on things because situations can spin like this one did. So, for me, really good story, good outcome, but not at the finish line yet. How do we get in this situation where it took something like this to right or wrong? We'll see. Moving on to what is quickly becoming the hot topic on the message board that again is not basketball related the current number one team in the big 12 uh, mm. asterisk the baseball team bit cruncher asks, what do you think of wv's prospects in the big 12 race down the home stretch of the current baseball season we're in the thick of the race for the conference crown yeah can we give them first place they took tied to three from oklahoma right yeah and one of that's the tiebreaker right I'll do it. Like it I'll is. Do it. I don't care. I don't cover baseball. Um, listen, all you gotta do is win series now. Just two out of three. You know, win one, lose one, win the rubber match, win the first two, whatever, win series, and you can afford to maybe go one and two and get it back with a three and zero. Oh. Like that's why getting the sweep over the weekend is important too. I don't know why you would discount West Virginia. They've done this before. Um, this is kind of this is this is not how they expected to be here. This is where they expected to be. Everything in the preseason was let's get back to the point where the team can have a chance to win the conference tournament again and not stub your toe time after time after time toward the finish. And here you go, Chris, you know, right in position where I think they play 30 big 12 games. There are 12 in. So a lot of work left to do, obviously six more series, but good split home and away win more than you lose. That's the goal every time. But what's curious to me is that how many teams right now are adding, Oh, one of the best players in the country a pretty valuable offensive weapon who's a really good catcher too, an upgrade over what they have in playing a catcher. And they've thrown so many pitchers out there in so many different roles and combinations that I think it's going to be hard for them not to have a, a pretty decent arrangement of arms from starters to middle relievers to back end relievers Friday, Saturday, and especially Sunday. Those Sunday games are going to be really important because, you know, who knows what happens on a Friday and Saturday. You run into a hot arm. I think you'll see some teams put their Friday starters on Saturdays now just naturally in a competitive sense. And if West Virginia you know, wins one, loses one, but has four or five arms it can use on a Sunday game, going to be really important too. They went through a bunch of ups and downs and ins and outs. And here they are tied for first place, asterisk first place in the conference. I think right now you get like a yeah, conference championship. That'd be cool. But you know, why can't you get into a regional again? I think that's a bigger goal and certainly attainable, which again, probably not what you were thinking three weeks ago, but that's what you were thinking when the season started. It all makes sense. You get you get your position players healthy ish. You get them back. You get what would be the number one overall pick in the Major League Baseball draft this summer back. That helps with fielding when you get these guys back and in the positions they were trained to play in. That helps with your hitting when you get these guys, big time hitters back. And then the pitching was always going to be. I mean, I remember at the beginning of the year when we did our preview, it was like there's a lot of new guys here. There's a lot of unknowns. Who's going to pitch? Do they have enough starters? They had a lot of arms, but not a lot of guys with starting experience. That's working itself out. I think they're starting to find the right answers, like you noted, and now they're going to start kind of moving guys around and finding the right uh, rotation uh, for the rest of the way. Like, two people asked me, and I've already looked this up, so if you want me to go ahead and answer it, I will. Mm -hmm. But four consecutive home runs, back to back to back to back, has to be pretty rare. Uh, WV, WVU Snids and Montana Ear both asked about it. They asked an NCAA. I could not find it. Uh, could not find the answer to that, but did find a story from MLB.com about 
Major League Baseball and said it was so rare. The very first time it happened, 1961. You know, baseball had already been played for 80 years, and that involved Hank Aaron. It was part of the four that hit that uh, for the Braves back in 1961. It's happened one, two, three. Uh, it happened in 61, 63, 64, and then went 42 years without happening again. And then 6, 06, 07, 08, 10, 17, 19, 20. And according to this, most recently in 1922 with the St. Louis Cardinals. So 100 and however many years of baseball, 150 plus, and you got it three, six, nine, eleven 11 times. That's it in Major League Baseball. So. I- that surprises me that it's happened that often. Yeah. Like, I, I think 11 might have yeah. been much. I, I felt like that long stretch between the start in 1961 and from 1964 to 06 made sense, but a little run recently, I guess. Um, I don't know when this happened. I, I searched trying to find it. It's not in a record book. I'm sure it's actually happened. I don't know how that's not first paragraph of the news release. Like, is it the first time it's happened in school history? How often has it happened in the Big 12? How often has it happened in the NCAA? It's such a unique thing that you kind of figure that, I don't know, it should be in there, too. Um, Chris, it happened over seven pitches, too. That's wild. Um, a 3-0 pitch to Logan Sov. Uh, I think, though, yeah, here we go. 3 pitch to Logan Sov. Um, Sam White homers on a 1-0 pitch. So that's two in three pitches. Chumley homers on a 1-1 pitch. That is five. Sorry, eight pitches. And then West homers. So um, four homers and eight pitches. That's pretty good work right there. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's a question that they get answered over time, too. So I guess the bummer is, Chris, it was just four solo homers, you know? Yeah. Get some yeah. guys on base. Come on. Can't have four back-to-back two-run homers, four back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back, three-run homers. Just four. I don't know. I feel like they could have done more damage with four homers. Only drove in five runs, but shucks. You have to work on that. Yep. Uh, next question this is from Hamilton220. I guess this is interesting. Non-sports related. Would Mike, would you consider recording your three things and releasing it as a podcast each week? I like Mike is a what is this, an audio book every week? Voice. How long how long is that podcast for your three things? It, can we fit it in under 40 minutes? Yeah, but I was gonna say it might take a little bit longer. Listen, I'm trying to be more brief on that right now. It's still three and three, but I'm trying to be less wordy about stuff. But people like that that uh, format. Could I actually read it? Maybe we get some AI. Maybe um, I mean, it's content, right? It's all about the clicks. So perhaps we go. can. I can't imagine anybody want to read it that wouldn't listen to it. And I think there are some people who are, I, don't know, I guess it's like a different strokes, different folks thing. Cause I get a lot of people who are like, Hey, can you a transcript of the podcast? No. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd write it, right? Uh, yeah. Now flip it around. Can I actually speak the, the three things? No. Otherwise, I wouldn't write it, right? But okay. maybe for this one. Well, Mike, now we're going to switch gears to this this sport called football. They play it at West Virginia University. We, we've talked basketball. Wait, no, we're not. Actually, we're not. You know what? We're, go- we're going to talk about the thing that is actually taking the country by storm. Is the mm-hmm. most popular sport in the country right now. Women's basketball. Oh, okay. It, and that's not exaggeration. You saw the ticket prices. Four times as much for the women's national championship game than the men's. Um, the previous week, the I think it was the final four game, right, with uh, Iowa and LSU. I haven't seen the numbers yet for Iowa, South Carolina, but Iowa, LSU was a, a bigger game than many of the ones that were not uh, or one of the most watched games in ESPN history for non-football. So it's big. And there goes Tavon wants to know, do WVU fans follow the rest of the country and take interest in the women's program, increase season ticket sales, and is WVU structured from a marketing and ticket sales standpoint to make this happen? Like, yeah. Can they yeah. make it happen? Has it already started to happen? I guess is yeah. an, another part of that. I, I think so. Um, that was one thing that I think Mark Kellogg wanted to get into right away. Like he had good support at SFA and, and um, that's kind of like a basketball crazy campus too. It could be, they're, they're a small school. When football is good, it's good there. We saw men's basketball several years ago with Thomas walk up and that really good team with Brad Underwood, but that's not like a one-off thing. They've been good for a while and people were really happy about it. And Kellogg did the same thing there with his women's program. People here, I, I would say this, I know people who are not sports fans who uh, aren't really interested in the university. They live in Morgantown. Like, oh, there's a football game this weekend. Yeah, it's right behind your house. You didn't notice that? 
And they're really big women's basketball fans now. Now, part of that is because, like, you have some generational talent on the women's side between, like, uh, the players at USC and Iowa and LSU and, and UConn. Just, like, there's there's old and new names as far as, like, programs. But what's curious to me is that, like, people really may know about, like, LSU women's basketball or Baylor women's basketball or UConn women's basketball. Like, there are programs for women's basketball that has been synonymous with success for a long, long time. What's happened, though, Chris, is that like in the YouTube generation and the Twitter generation and social media where you can learn about a player through TikTok and Instagram, that is how players now, how fans now become attached to programs or the sports. So you might not have like Iowa women's basketball fans. You have Caitlin Clark fans and you may not have, you know, USC women's basketball fans, but you have fans at Juju. So like that's a cool thing that's made that like apparent that it's it certainly is breaking into the mainstream. That's how people connect to sports right now. So, again, You'll see people who wear jerseys of a player, but like they don't really like the team. Like, I don't know if I like the Atlanta Hawks, but I like Trey Young. You'll see a lot of that for people. And that's how they connect to a team. They get into the sport. That's happening. Now, can they, can they do that with the women's team here, too? Like, they're going to get West Virginia basketball fans because they're West Virginia fans. But are you going to have people who are fans of, like, Jordan Harrison or of Kaya Watson? Like, can you do that? So those players are, are kind of clever when it comes to that now, too. And NIL, I know people really focus on – on um like football and men's basketball for nil a lot of the neat stuff when it comes to nil stuff like gymnastics or track and field it's through like social media and like small media kind of ventures but they're really good at that too so if you find players now who just naturally were promoting their profile through their tiktok and through their twitter and through their social media you know expertise experience enterprise whatever you want to call it the other part of that now is, too, is they create a whole new audience for them to have fans of games. Maybe buy a jersey or buy a T-shirt and give them some money for that. But also, they'll come to games because they know that person. They want to come out. So I know people who were like, yeah, I'll go watch the team, but I really like watching Jordan Harrison play defense. She was in SFA last year. And she's a big deal here now, too. Player of the year on defense is a big total. People know that about here. Obviously, everybody knows Quinterly. Fine. But, like, I've had people explain to me, like, how important I Watson is, too. And like she moves around and she sets screens, she'll make some threes, she'll rebound and whatever. I'm like, I had no idea, but they got to know her through different avenues. So there's some organic stuff that just naturally makes sense for them. And I think you'll see, and you should see, and you will see them lean into, you know, the team is good, but man, there's some individual star power here, some talent, something that's accommodating because women's basketball is so um, communal where you're not expecting 14,000 people, but if you get like 3,500, 4,500, that's awesome. And you can do that because you don't have to like throw out a huge net and appeal to everybody. You just find small connections to people and, and just watch them do events, you know, watch them do some things that they could be NIL stuff where they borrow from like the baseball, um, their, their little program. They have the Monday on Mondays. If you could find something like that, where you, you're a small little community that knows the 13 player, I guess, 15 players in the team, you, you know, you, you follow one or two or five of them, but you also know the team and you get to know, go to the games and watch them play defense. And the coach is out there and he's really involved with people. Uh, there, there's a lot of potential for this to grow. They're good. Don't get me wrong. They're going to be good again next year. But now, you know, you know, the team is good. Now get to know the players more because I think people connect with players much more than teams nowadays. But also when you have a, a thing that's as big in Morgantown as WVU is, they're going to naturally lean into a team that's good. And if you give them reasons to really like the players, they're going to be that much more bought into things. I think it's extremely important for women's basketball as a whole and at WVU to capitalize on this moment because this is it. Like, and, and it might only be one chance. Like, well, not, not one chance, but it might be your best chance in a long time. Because as you noted, from a national perspective, you have the, the perfect blend. You had an all-time great player in Caitlin Clark. You added in all-time great freshmen like Juju at uh, USC. Um, you got uh, Beckers over at UConn. And then you, who's got this amazing story coming back from injury and being this also supposed to be one of the greatest players ever. And then you got this team at US, uh, uh, excuse me, I was about to say USC. I know they would like that, but South Carolina, um, it's more of a team thing. Not, I don't wouldn't say there's one player that really stood out as much, but they're doing something incredible, going undefeated and winning the national championship. You have all of that happening at the same time. And that's not even to mention like LSU and, and Reese and everything like that all blending together together at the perfect time. You have to capitalize on that. And West Virginia has some of that as well. They get an All-American. They get some new transfers. They get a new coach. They get ranked. They make it into the NCAA tournament. We're going to be ranked in the preseason poll for next year. Like, 
there is an opportunity here for West Virginia, uh, you know, in a more of a macro scale or micro scale than the national um, audience to really build on this kind of like you said, but it, it again, maybe not a one time chance, but this is, might be your best chance in a long time to really kind of capitalize that and keep momentum going. Yep. They've done it before too. Remember, they had like, they had like where they stylized the team as like comic book characters and that mm -hmm. connected to, they had all those kids days and they have early tip offs and, you know, there's, there's different ways to gear it up. And again, they have the seed, which is like, here's a good team and a good coach and they're going to be successful. Cool. But now, by the way, look at all these great personalities and players on the team too. Like I, I'm just struck this year by how many things I learned from people. I just didn't have a ton of like bandwidth to cover women's basketball or follow women's basketball, to be honest with you. But I learned a lot just by listening to people and people having me ask questions like, Hey, uh, the big from Germany, Eric Babu, what happened to her? And I was like, who? <laughs> But she fell and she had like a concussion and people were really worried about her because here's someone who barely plays, but they love the way she screens and rolls and just throws herself around. And here's a junior college player from Germany who's in Morgantown right now. What a cool story that is. I had no idea, Chris. But that's the type of connection you have is that people are really interested because they know a little bit about this person. Yeah, they care about their well-being. Like she hits her head. That hurts. That stinks, right? But is she going to be back because she's valuable? And by the way, I'm rooting for her because she has an awesome story. I was like, oh, cool. And then people who point out the stuff about Watson, like Watson, like I'm not going to like Chris, like one of my favorite players to watch. Because she's active and she does a million different things, right? In, in varying degrees of success. But, like, people pointed out to me, like, watch her. She shoots three. She guards a big. She guards a guard. She cuts. She rolls. She rebounds. Has highs. Has lows. And I was like, wow. But she never comes off the court. And they only, only play, like, what, seven players this year, too? So just things like that that people explain to me. Imagine if you could do that to hundreds of people at a time or even thousands of people, too. Just give them reasons to buy in, to watch, and get to know the people and to care about how they perform. Not a not a difficult recipe. They got a really a really cool chance here to stir in the right direction. Right. Let me uh lots of women's suit. Yeah. As I was gonna say, now we're gonna have to switch over to football. Hey, look at this. Football and West Virginia University is getting crunched for time right here. This is yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a good thing that all sports are healthy sports, especially at West Virginia right now. That's good. Um, let's rapid fire through a couple of these early ones for football before we get into more in-depth answer answers. Um any ideas on who will lock up the number Q, number three quarterback spot? That was a video that went up on the site the other day. Got any thoughts on that or anything you've seen? Mm, I think Scott Keen, Keen. I think I think Scott Keen's a cool story, but I don't know why it wouldn't be Sean Boyle unless he's just lagging behind and not developing. But like it's probably a time now they want to see some progress for him. But also like it's a second year too, and here's a guy who was a wing T quarterback. They like him. He's more athletic and faster than he thought. It's going to take some time to get him into this college system that he's in. But uh, my 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 chips would be on that one. I think. Uh, Professor asked over or under seven and a half commits by Memorial Day. Uh, I'm going to go under right now. They're at four. And I know you're thinking, hey, holy cow, hey, seven and a half. That's not much more of a number. But the official visits start the week after Memorial Day. So I do think, you know, you might get one. I, actually, I know of one. Wink, check the board. Um, so you're going to end up with five, maybe. Man, I don't know. Six or seven sounds like a good number because and then you're going to get to that first weekend, the week right after Memorial Day, and you might set the line for seven and a half for that week right there. So don't be discouraged by the fact that I'm saying under. I just think it's going to be right around. That's a good line that you set right there, uh, Professor. I'm um, going to disagree with you, Chris. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Push. <laughs> seven and a half exactly. Okay. You Last get it. Half. <laughs> um uh gd full says no names obviously but do you have any concerns over losing important players in the two deep to the portal after spring football i guess a key name for me might not be for other people um like well, I'm like, well man if rj cocaine leaves that's bad news um I, I, listen that's a natural concern for sure um yeah what do you think on this one here? I have another answer for you in a second, but what do you think? You know, I think there's always going to be concern. They're never not going to be thinking it's possible, but I believe when they have these guys signed to the trust for 2024, and as we've noted many times when they started announcing it, hey, it's not going to completely lock them in. Like, you know, it's not like that. None of these deals are like that. But the trust isn't going to sign these guys to these deals, and they're not going to sign these deals with the trust unless there's a pretty good mutual understanding that they are going to be here um, for the upcoming season. So I think as far as all of those guys that signed with those deals, we'll be in a pretty good spot to return. I wouldn't worry about them too deep. There's a couple guys that, you know, I think were really highly rated, say for coming out of high school 
that were expected to make early contributions, and maybe they're on their third year here at West Virginia and have not yet broken into the starting lineup. Do they want to be a backup again? We'll see. But I think for the most part, West Virginia should be in good shape at that uh, post-spring portal. There's always potential for a surprise. Uh, man, they didn't need that, or why well, I didn't see that coming. I'm not sure as a negative on West Virginia as it is just a negative in college sports. Um, to your NIL point, it's a really good one, Chris. The way that they tier their contracts is 15%, 70%, 15%. Where do you think the two 15% are? The 70% is the meat of the, like the, the time they want them on campus. So they can get some of their money now. If they leave, they're going to forfeit 85% of their money. Um, that's not a good thing for those players. And then number two, number three, they started spring football late. Okay. They went to spring break, came back, had a week of nothing, and then started spring practice. Chris, there are two weeks of spring practice left after the portal opens. They have moved the the end zone on us here. So you could leave after spring football. You are two weeks behind everybody else. Um I'd like to ask Neil Brown this if he did this on purpose. Like that extra week was kind of diabolical when you think about it. Because two weeks out after the spring game, like the spring game is the twenty seventh i think the portal had been open for like 12 days at that point mm -hmm. you're you're gonna be lagging if you go in the portal a couple days after spring football um, i wonder if brown did that on purpose he'll never give me a straight answer on that i'm sure and I'm, I'm presuming that he did do that on purpose and he wouldn't tell me if that's just a coincidence fine but like i i do wonder if in the future if you see a team really think about the portal as like a, a starting line in relation to the finish on a spring football because i think that's gonna it's gonna make people think about man would it be better off for me to come back and just use all these visibility and improvement opportunities over the summer when my coaches can actually see me work with me and I can prove a little bit more than I could in 15 practices rather than like, let me start from scratch on my third or fourth year in college football at a new program. That's, that's a tricky thing for people to consider. So you're telling me I should pencil in spring game 2025, the same weekend as Memorial day weekend next year. That was right, the best thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> the spring game will be on July 3rd this year. That's just checking. All right. Um, 83, 89 grad asked, what do you expect like Neil Brown to shake up in the off season offense this season? Uh, you know, more use of running backs in the passing game. He gives as an example, anything you think in particular is going to be different about that offense? I uh, mean, I've been thinking about this for a while. Like, Oh, let's go two back sets. Never really happened. Uh, tight end personnel. Like you might have two in the field. One is a receiving threat. Um, I'm not sure that they're going to like their offensive line enough to go like just, 10 formation and four receivers out. So um, I don't, I don't, I'm not optimistic about that. And like, the more I think about how I envisioned them using someone like Rodney Gallagher, we're like, let's just find ways to pepper him with touches. I, I don't know that he is such a talent right now that you give him like, is he a player who gets like 40 catches and 40 carries? I think I mentioned that before, like a 40, 40 guy. That seems pretty bull, but like, would he be a 20, 20 guy? 20 touches on a carry that can go to somebody else. And you got those running backs. I'm not sure how great of an idea is. I just so yeah, there's these great ideas that sound really cool. Perhaps they pursue them here and there situationally or the guys on a hot streak, but like regular features. And I don't really see them reinventing the wheel here. Yeah. I'm with you. you. You start trying to do all this cool and quirky stuff. And then you're taking yourself away from your strengths and you're doing something that's different, but you're not as good at it. And it's not just that, but you're not doing the things you're good at. So yep. I'm with you. I don't see it changing too much. Um, I don't know how to say this guy's name. PSA LNM. I always thought it was Psalm, but um, he asks, do you think the secondary will improve? Sometimes they look good. Other times they looked really bad last year. I mean, they were a little bit better last year than the year before. I think what they're doing on the defensive line, excuse me, on the, in the defensive backfield as like what they were doing on the offensive line, where it's going to take a couple of years. The weird thing is that rather than invest in youth on the offensive line that paid off with the kind of experience and camaraderie, they're just looking like a multi-year rebuild for what? Just just getting better over time at transfer portal acquisitions? I guess so. But like if you're going to require a hit rate every year, that's dicey. And do they have enough like corners and safeties in the program right now where they could wean themselves off the portal? I don't know about that, Chris. Do you? Like you're asking a lot of like Jordan Jackson, Josiah Jackson. I mean, and who else is profiling as a corner and a safety right now? I guess like Zay Jennings, Israel Boyce. Those are a lot of safeties, right? Not really a lot of corners. So can their cornerback recruiting get better? I don't know. But I guess to answer your question, can it be better? It better be better because that would be regression if it's not, as opposed to where they were like two years ago. If they're back 
in 2024 where they were in 2022. Well, not only you're not only questioning your your portal acquisitions, like were they good enough, but the whole processes that goes into it and whatever plan you've had on the defensive staff is this is this really good? Did it, it got a little bit better last year? But if it goes backwards, if it doesn't get as much improvement this year, um, I think you really have to question things a little bit. That will say is they had the pieces in there, like they they should be okay at safety. They got two starters. They should be able to find some depth. If that's even like a Jaheim Joseph is a guy who moves around, um, that's fine. I'm not sure they want to be putting their freshmen in the two deep right now, so maybe that's not a great thing for them. So you're asking again, you know, someone like Josiah Jackson, can he be a safety back there? Can Aiden Nelson be a safety back there? They're going to need that to click. You can't really ask like your portal guys to be your starters as well as your backups because that means they're not starting in certain spots. Corners should be better. They really like Garnett. Um, Garnett, uh, boy, I'm forgetting his last, last name. All this. I was going to say Thompson. Garnett Hall. Yeah, li like him a lot. Big guy can move, too. And can they find combinations there, whether it's spells? Is it Garns? Could it be Jordan Jackson? We'll see. But um, I would say there's not a definitive answer right now, which I'm not sure, you know, a third of the way through spring practice, it could be a, like an exclamation point. I guess a little bit more than a third right now. But the pieces are certainly there to arrange. And, and that was the same situation as last year. And last year it got a little bit better. And with you, you're rolling the dice each time. It does look like their their portal acquisitions have been are more experienced, more talented than they were two years ago, three years ago. Um, but you're still putting in new pieces and asking them to fix figure it out on the fly, and you're going to keep doing it every year. It's going to make things very difficult. And then when you have Neil Brown saying, "Hey, might add another transfer in the defensive backfield," and as you noted, it's going to be hard to convince transfers to come over if they're not starting because this would be for a backup role anybody else that they add he was talking about you know if the freshmen essentially if the young guys don't look like they're ready they might go back in the portal but if you're going back in the portal for a backup that you know how good is that portal acquisition going to be to be a backup it, it gets a little dicey here and, and you you're always rolling the dice with transfers and last year kind of worked out this year we'll see um, yeah, last year, don't forget though, there was also like Keyshawn Cobb, who was here and gone, like a transfer or transfers. That's that's kind of like a sunk cost there, right? Um, so it was good last year. It wasn't perfect. So are uh, uh, Hollis and Joseph and Garns are they going to be click click click? Likely not. So you got to have some sort of a plan there, which means like those those red shirt freshmen, the people who've been in the program for a couple of years, they really do have to matter now because if they don't work and all the transfers don't click, which is a big ask, asking all your transfers to click, then you're really scrambling that back end. Next couple questions from Wampus. He wants to know, do you think Neil Brown has changed some of his views on how he wins games? He references aggressiveness on offense and not just getting a lead and protecting it. Take some time to learn, I think, what your personnel is and what you can do. They didn't have the gasoline to, to score with teams before, and I think they felt a little bit more emboldened by that. So if he did seem a little bit sheepish when he had a lead, and as you wonderfully colored – last season that was hard to refute if you if you transpose that toward the last couple of games where they did get into some shootouts and like when they did have to put their pedal to the metal and go that's that's a sign that he believed a little bit but i think he probably knew how to do that i just think that sometimes you know you don't want to touch the burner because you know how it feels and if you go really fast you punt really fast or if you try to throw it deep and you're about a 35% completion percentage on deep. Well, 65% of the time you're coming back on your second and 10 or third and 10. So I think you learn a little bit about that too. What's what's in the shell here when you look at this, I think is most interesting to me is what they did at the end of halves or when they were in like that two minute, three minute, four minute drill. They they were effective. Like they won games and they got points at the end of halves. And when they were down multiple scores, they could get back into games by going fast. I'm not saying that they were a let's play fast team, but there are certain characteristics and certain abilities in that two minute, four minute situation that are fundamental to a team being a learn how to win football team. And that's, you know, moving the chains. That's, you know, getting past the yard marker to catch the pass. It's, you know, just smart stuff you have to do. And to do that under pressure in a hurry, there's a lot of that's transferable to other parts of winning football. That's a good sign. So if they taught that better, if they learned that better, if that was just like, you know, fluky situations and circumstances, that's still all good signs for a team that is more competent and more confident in what it can do and how it can win. All right. I'm setting up the two minute offense, Mike. We got three questions to get down in the last three minutes or two all minutes. 
Wampus asks, do you feel like this might be Neil Brown's first team that can play all three phases for 60 minutes? Sure. Best bet. I, yes. No Is idea how to answer bet? that in the middle of April. <laughs> Uh, I was going to say, do you think it's the best bet so far? I mean, because I think each year we've looked at the teams and said, hey, that offense is going to be bad. Or the, another year, hey, offense might be better, but the defense is bad. Last year got close to everything being better. You know, both at all three sides had the good and the bad. Maybe this is the year with the best chance of all three sides being good is, yeah. is okay. how I would take it. Um, BNWVU72 asks, would you consider this football team deep? as it stands now elite deep deep oh no okay i good answer because i was gonna say the scholarship numbers they're still above the limit guys are gonna have to leave have to leave before these guys arrive in the summer the high school recruits arrive in the summer um that does not necessarily mean they are deep they have bodies they have lots of bodies I think there still needs to be some things figured out to determine that this team is deep. So yeah. good. Yeah, that was the first time Mike's given the short answer and I've given the long one. There we go. And our final question comes from Crowtown ear. He asks, do you think with the portal and immediate transfers, do you think there will be some level of parity across college football? Well, you want to say yes, because that's what everybody suggests now. Like the transfer portal is like this get rich quick scheme for any school to make that. And I suppose there's a lot to that. I think it's a lot easier to do that and to argue for that in college basketball, because you only need like eight people, really, maybe nine. And if you can stick a couple transfers every year, you know, not all eight or nine, but a couple of them who can start or give you great minutes off the bench and productivity. Sure. Scale that out to football, though, Chris. Like you're talking an equivalent from 13 scholarships to 85 um, the ratio there of, I don't know, like half, are you, are you going to nail like 40 transfers if, if that's the theory? I don't know that that actually works. The other part of that, though, is that you're inviting more people into the championship conversation for conferences, like in the Big 12, because there's no dominant one right now, no dominant team. And also in every these all these major conferences, you're getting two or three bids into the playoff, which naturally has more people now. So I think there will be an argument that it's more inviting and therefore there is more parity. I think when you really roll up your sleeves, though, you're going to find like a concentration of high value transfers, um, small number at a small number of schools and the, the schools that really do strike it rich, so to speak, in, in postseason play. They're going to have a, a lot of continuity players who've been in the program for a couple of years in the trenches who understand the offense. Um, and maybe they are older. Maybe they're fourth year seniors and things like that that don't seem too common now, but. Um, I don't think it's going to be this, you know, strike it rich, quick fix that everybody thinks. And everybody's going to have the same button because everybody's doing the same thing. How do you distinguish yourself there? You're going to have to find your thing. Your thing is probably going to be keeping players and developing them. Yeah, I don't know how different it's going to be than the before time, if you will, where there's a handful of teams that are just elite. And they're going to be elite, and that's that. Then there's probably another tier there where it's another 10 to 15 schools. And then after that, it's, what, 60 schools or something like that, that it could all make or break based off of um, your schedule, some injury luck, all that stuff that can really just kind of push you anywhere from 25th to 75th uh, in, in out of 130 teams. So don't know how different it is because, like you said, everyone's doing the same thing. So, yeah, sure, some of the guys that are leaving, let's say, Georgia, to go find more playing time somewhere else. Everybody on that next tier is trying to get those guys. Everybody. So it's I don't know how much it's going to be different from where it already is right now. It it's just going to be a different group of guys, uh, you know, that are making the difference here, transfers instead of high school recruits. So well, Mike, I think that is we have wiped out the mailbag. We we between two podcasts, we have answered every single question that was in there. Do you have any questions? Why are people so mad at us about the Monday podcast? Like angry, angry. Like you're a panic comer. Yeah, that was strong. Uh-huh. Now, I, I did appreciate that person's opinion. Like, okay, it's, yeah. it's early still, but like, pretty sure we said that. Yeah. People are on it, edge it right now. We need news, Darren. We need assistant coaches. We need portal acquisitions. And again, this, this weekend will be important for a bunch of reasons. We're halfway through the week. Um, no news is good news. I don't know about that, but um, 
they need to they need to have some headlines by this time next week. I think that's fair to say. I don't think that's like negative demeaning or anything. Just like you want to progress because you got momentum and people are feeling excited about something that isn't nine and twenty three. They'd like to believe in it. So give them something to believe in. I don't think that's a bold or controversial statement there. If it came across that way, I'm sorry that you feel that way. Not because of what I said. I'm sorry that Mike made you feel that way. Yeah. I think it's fair. So please accept my apology for your mistake. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. More feedback? That'll it's wrap more it up. feedback. Yeah. Wrap it up. Well, wrap it up before we open up another QA mailbag and that sound you hear is people, flames. That sound you hear is people canceling their subs for the free podcast, I'm sure. Yeah. Until then, we make more people mad for things that aren't our fault. I'm Mike Casaza. And I'm Chris Anderson. We will talk to you then.